Long before Europeans and Americans first appeared in the fertile river valleys of the Columbia Plateau, Indian prophecy predicted their arrival. It was the fulfillment of the prophecy that there would be a new people who come, these newcomers would bring changed ways, and that we would be facing very, very difficult times in our future. The changes would come quickly, and not without great cost, to both the newcomers and to the people who had long called this land home. In 1831, four Plateau Indians leave their villages in the Pacific Northwest and set their course for St. Louis, Missouri. A story emerges that they asked about the Christian Bible, the white man's book of heaven. They've learned about it from fur traders who have brought not just trade goods, but Christianity to the Columbia Plateau. There is a religious dialogue that takes place between Indians and fur traders. Indians asking questions about the white man's God, about the uh, white man's book. These fur traders seem to have greater spirit power than their own because they mostly did not get sick of smallpox and these other diseases that were ripping through the plateau periodically. Our people value spiritual and personal power very highly. I suspect that uh, what people, some people came to say was education or reading and writing in the white man's power was what we sought. And others have said it was quite strictly the Bible. I suspect it was both. The story of this encounter is promoted during the Second Great Awakening, one of the biggest periods of religious revival in American history. A big part of the Second Great Awakening is once you're saved, you're not done. You are responsible for saving others. In some of the missionary newspapers, it said millions are heading to hell unless you can go out and help save them. The story spreads like wildfire. An editorial in The Christian Advocate calls for action. Let the church awake from her slumbers and go forth in her strength to the salvation of these wandering sons of our native forests. Among the first to heed the call is a newly married couple from upstate New York, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. In the spring of 1836, five years before any immigrants cross the Oregon Trail, they part from friends and family and head west to Oregon country. The Whitmans, along with fellow travelers Henry and Eliza Spaulding and William Gray, have been appointed by the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions to bring Christianity to the Indians and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Marcus Whitman, a 33-year-old doctor, had long dreamed of doing missionary work. 28-year-old Narcissa had similar aspirations. Marcus and Narcissa, they were an impressive couple. He was a man of integrity, of energy, intelligence. She had been reared in a very loving Christian family highly educated, committed Christians. She was a very unusual young woman. She had, since her mid-teens, decided that she wanted to be a missionary, and there were very few female missionaries at the time. Dear, dear mother, we are making arrangements for crossing the mountains and shall expect to unless prevented in the providence of God. Few Eastern men, besides trappers, traders, and explorers, have made this arduous trip across the continent. Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spaulding are the very first non-Indian women known to have completed the journey. It seems to me now that we are on the very borders of civilization. I have not one feeling of regret at the step which I have taken, but count it a privilege to go forth in the name of my master, cheerfully bearing the toil and privation that we expect to encounter. And I think that people admired Marcus and Narcissa Whitman and their commitment. And it's quite a brave commitment because you were essentially going to say goodbye to your families and never see them again. Their goal is to minister to the native peoples of the Columbia Plateau, Cayuse, Walla Walla, and Umatilla. These are some of the tribes that had inhabited these hills and valleys for thousands of years.
the Whitmans will be invited to build a mission among the Cayuse at a site on the Walla Walla River called Wailetpu, the place of the rye grass. We had but one heart with this land. There's a song that we have is Ticham Natitite, you know, the people of the land, they're one in the same. We believe the Creator gave us this place to live. Our people had lived here for thousands of years with the land teaching us how to live here. The relationship between all living things is one of reciprocity and balance and sustenance. We had spiritual practices, we had faith that was part and parcel of our way of life every single day. It is based on our foods and we greeted the day in prayer. In September, after a seven-month journey across the continent, they arrive, filled with good intentions. The Indians welcome them and give them permission to build on Indian land. It's decided the Spaldings will start their mission amongst the Nez Perce in what is present-day Idaho. The Whitmans will stay with the Cayuse. Many challenges lie ahead, building a home, a mission, and establishing a farm. They are not the only non-Indians in the region. They are part of a dynamic society composed of British, French, and American trappers, other missionaries, and trading forts. Yet unlike the Hudson's Bay Company, their goal is to transform the lives of the native people of the Walla Walla Valley. It is this relationship with the Cayuse that will challenge them the most. The Whitmans came with a very strong idea of what their role was. Now, Sissa, would you listen to this, please? I cast myself upon the Lord. I know he will direct in every emergency. On the one hand was their belief that the Indians were ready and willing. Joined with that was their belief that they were way lower on the scale of um, humanity and civilization. Pray for us and the heathen. We hope and pray for a revival of religion. If our own hearts were united and right, we shall see it soon, and a general want too. There's no question that Whitman thought his culture was far superior to these heathens, but they could learn. It wasn't hopeless. But in time, they can be acculturated. I don't believe that our people ever thought that we were inferior. I do believe that we were curious, inquisitive, and acquisition-minded when it came to new technologies and new forms of power. We will now sing from your hymnals. We will be singing hymn number 128. Ye sons of the earth, prepare the plow. Please stand. Please stand up. The Cayuse are initially receptive to the Whitmans, though they learn that the Whitmans' beliefs differ significantly from their own. There are concepts that are new. Heaven and hell are new. And the idea that all people are born as sinners must have been completely alien. At first, the mission seems to go very well. The Indians are very interested. They want to learn. When uh, Marcus gives a sermon, the Indians show up in large numbers to listen. They ask him to be baptized. But within the first year, conflicts and miscommunications begin to mount. Neither speaks nor understands the other's language well. I think a lot of the problem between the Whitmans and the Indians begins with his preaching. From Ezekiel 18, verse 31. Make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die? The Indians lived in an oral culture, and in an oral culture, words are objects. Words have power. Words can hurt people. The Spirit of God may depart from you, the offer of life may be made no more, and this one more slighted offer of mercy may close up your account and seal you over for all time to the horrors of eternal death. So when Marcus says things like, you are all going to hell, which is, of course, a very popular thing for evangelical uh, Protestants to say back then, 
the Indians heard it as, I am sending you to hell. It was a very aggressive thing to say. If you desire in the job description for missionaries coming to our country, and they be uh, nurturing, understanding, benevolent, and patient, they were none of the above. I believe they thought they were. By the end of the second year, the Cayuse are gaining an understanding of what the missionaries expect of them. For the Cayuse, Christianity was something that they could add to what they already believed. While we sought certain kinds of change that had to do with economic and spiritual power, we didn't seek all the ways that they required us to change and meet their criteria for being good human beings. The thorny ground is To the Whitmans, nothing less than eternity was on the line here. The Cayuse are on the brink of hell, and the Whitmans have given up everything to try and pull them back from that. The Cayuse and other Indians, as they lose interest in the missions, they vote with their feet. They simply stop showing up to the services. By 1841, five years after the Whitmans established the mission at Wai'iletpu, a new movement is underway in America. The country's growing population begins spreading west. In the fall, 24 immigrants cross the mountains into Oregon country. The next year, 114 newcomers arrive. Immigration came as first a trickle, then a stream, then a flood. Others came behind that family, and others, and others, and others. When was it gonna stop? In 1843, a thousand people make the journey. Wai'iletpu, in the heart of Cayuse land, is located near the path that will become the Oregon Trail. The mission becomes a resting place where weary travelers can receive food and medical care from Dr. Whitman before they head down to the Willamette Valley. In the immigrants, Whitman finds a new purpose. Marcus begins writing that it's pretty clear that what God really wanted him in the Oregon Territory for was to help these immigrants, to help Americans claim Oregon for their own. The travelers from the east bring goods and livestock and new opportunities for native people to trade. But they also bring disease. The Cayuse are dismayed by the impact of whooping cough, dysentery, and influenza. It's the whole litany of 19th century white diseases hitting the plateau all at once and hitting no one harder than the Cayuse. Dr. Whitman's treatments seem to work for the immigrants, but not for the Cayuse, who die from their illnesses. This ignites a fear that's been smoldering for some time, that Marcus Whitman, the medicine man, is poisoning the Indians. Marcus is angrily confronted by Cayuse chiefs on multiple occasions. We're here to help you, to bring you closer to God. Marcus, come sit with me. Sister, I don't know how to You've got to stand up to them. I have to be careful or I could make the situation worse. I don't trust them. We have to trust that we're in God's hands. We're doing his work. He will take care of us. Now pray with me. Whitman is shaken, but stays committed to Wai'iletpu. In a letter after one encounter, Whitman describes the chief's accusations. He spoke of the Americans as having a design to obtain their country and property. And he spoke also of their being prepared with poison and infection to accomplish their purpose. You take our land and our food and take our beliefs away from us, we have a little bit of suspicion behind your motives. The Cayuse know the story. They know what's happened to Eastern Indians because Eastern Indians and mountain men have told them what happens. Wars, treaties, dispossession, decline in numbers, disease, all these things come with whites. The Indians make it very clear they want them gone. The mission isn't working as a mission. Why do they stay there? We will sing hymn number 115, Rock of Ages. Please stand. Missionaries don't return. It's a kind of life sentence, at least for the first half of the 19th century. If you came back, you were a failed missionary, and you lived under a kind of social stigma. The Whitmans had many warnings. Nez Perce, Cayuse, Walla Walla people all warned them. There were friends of the Whitmans who had warned that their fate was not a good one if they continued to stay. 
In August of 1847, the annual wave of immigrants begins to arrive, between four and 5,000 people. A group of about 75 crowds the mission house as winter sets in. They appear to bring with them yet another disease, measles. The measles struck the Cayus with unprecedented ferocity. One estimate by one journalist said that it was as many as six burials a day, or six deaths a day, most of them children. 500 strong, the Cayuse were, that band of Cayuse, the Wailuku band. And to have over half, 250, die because of the measles. No one could stop it. Whitman could minister to the non-Indian children, and they would recover. He would try to minister to Indian children, and they would die. The Indians increasingly believed that Marcus had bad medicine, bad spiritual medicine and bad actual medicine, and was, uh, was killing them. The Cayuse hold council meetings to decide what to do about Whitman. Some Indians want to kill the man they perceive as the evil doctor, but the people are divided. I don't want people to misunderstand. There were very, very devout Christians amongst our people who became uh, disciples in, this, in the ways that the Whitman wanted them. Tillakite, the chief of the band that lives near Wailetu, is a candidate for admission to the church. But on the night of November 28th, three children from his lodge die from the measles. The decision is made. Our future was out of our hands, and the only way to begin to get control back was to kill the Whitmans. November 29th, 1847. A small group of Cayuse gathers at the mission. Two men, alleged to be the chiefs Tillakite and Tomahas, come to the kitchen asking for medicine. The doctor is summoned. One of the children at the mission later described the moment when the attack began. We could hear loud and angry voices in the kitchen. Suddenly, there was a sharp explosion, a rifle shot, and we all jumped in fright for the outside door. Marcus Whitman has been mortally wounded, struck in the back of the head with a tomahawk, and then shot. Several other Indians join the attack. Of the 75 people at the mission that day, 13 are killed, 12 men, and Narcissa. 47 people are held captive for a month until they are ransomed by the Hudson's Bay Company. To many white Americans, the killing of the missionaries proved every racist stereotype they had about Indians. Look what these savage Indians did. The killing of the Whitmans becomes a national outrage. In most tellings of the story, we are the cruel murderers. People tend not to look at the other side of the coin from our perspective. We lost many, many, many families to the pandemics and the aid station to the pandemic migration was at Whitman Mission. Over the next two years, a volunteer pioneer militia rises up and takes revenge on all the native people in the region. When the Whitmans were killed, the Cayuse were blamed collectively, though the Americans demanded the individuals who had killed them. In a sense, the whole tribe was guilty. And not just the Cayuse, all the Indians of the interior suffered for the death of the Whitmans. So by reputation, a once great people, great horsemen, great hunters, great warriors, a great culture, the Cayuse culture, was first decimated by disease, and then the onslaught of slaughter that followed the Whitman killings. Next! Finally, in 1850, five Cayuse men, including Tillakite and Tamahas, surrender under pressure from tribal leadership. Five feet and three inches. The military harassed our people until they came up with the five who were real innocent. When they were sitting in a jail down in Oregon City, they said, did not your God give up his life to save your people? This is what we're doing to save our people. We're tired of running. We're tired of being scattered throughout the country. I think they had a pretty good idea that they were not coming back, and they did not. On May 24th, all five men are convicted at trial, 
and sentenced to hang. The execution is reported in the Oregon Spectator. This closes another act in the sad and horrible tragedy of Wailatpu. But the series of bitter events that claim so many lives is far from over. The killing of the Whitmans was used as a justification for everything that Americans wanted to do in terms of taking land from Indians after that point. In the years that follow, there is no stopping the westward surge of homesteaders, adventurers, and prospectors onto Indian land in the Oregon Territory. In May of 1855, just six miles from Wailatpu, a council is convened between the U.S. government and several tribes of the Columbia Plateau. After two weeks' deliberation, the tribal representatives reluctantly sign a treaty that carves up Indian land, making room for American immigrants. The Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse Indians are able to preserve a small portion of their lands as the Umatilla Indian Reservation. In that treaty, we ceded roughly 92% of what had been our homeland to the United States government. The Cayuse were the first ones moved out because people wanted the Walla Walla Valley, and the Cayuse were just in a way. Many think the Cayuse vanished in the years of bloodshed that followed the Whitman's deaths. By 1855, it was estimated that we might have had as few as 50 adult Cayuse men left at the time of the Treaty Council. Just as the prophecy predicted, there was great hardship, but the Cayuse and other Indian tribes survived. The difficult times absolutely were manifested in our lives for 150 years, and we're only now beginning to enjoy the possibility of becoming strong again. Though they are small in number, the Cayuse Indians continue to live on the land of their ancestors amidst the rolling hills of the Columbia River Basin. The Walla Walla Valley now bears the imprint of the values that the Whitmans brought west. Farms cover the landscape, much as they did in the Whitman's birthplace of New York State. The site of the Whitman's mission can still be explored today. Walking through Wailetpu, we can reflect on the meaning behind these tragic events that unfolded so many years ago in the place of the ryegrass. I think Americans have a tendency to be true believers and certainly to value uh, their culture, to think that it is superior to others and that others throughout the world would benefit from the virtues of freedom and democracy. And I think it's that true belief that can prove blinding. And yet that blindness is easy to understand if you really do think that you are superior you cannot legislate change in people. You cannot require change in people. You can inspire change in people and invite change in people. Perhaps the greatest lesson from all of this is that we might revisit the notion of respect, how we respect one another, how we respect the planet we live on, how we take care of each other and the planet. <laughs>